I wonder when we started with when Irish eyes are smiling, I was, I was wondering if we were going to get to uh, Danny Boy at one point or another or not. Excellent. Excellent. Good morning, or should I say top of the morning to you. Uh, my terrible, terrible Irish accent. How are you this morning? Everybody well? Good. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad you're here. I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, you can see the announcements we have listed in the worship folder uh, Tuesday morning, 9 o'clock. Uh, you're welcome to join us for Sorting Day for uh, donations for Secondhand Rose. Uh, coming up next Sunday after worship, uh, of course, we'll have our fellowship time after worship. And then uh, during the Sunday school hour, the deacons will meet next Sunday. Uh, looking ahead to Monday, March the 27th is the community dinner. That'll be at the First United Methodist Church. This month, it's, uh, it's our month to uh, help provide uh, some, of the, uh, some of the food. We're looking for salads and for desserts. You can let Maggie or Karen know if you are interested and able to help with that. Uh, choir practice on March the 30th, Thursday, March the 30th at 7 o'clock. Uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully there'll be some choir members who can join us and sing with us. We look forward to that. Uh, looking ahead to April, it's not listed here, but in April, uh, that's our month to provide the uh, afternoon uh, Vespers services uh, at the uh, Polo Rehab Center. Uh, and so I'll be going over each Sunday. And if some of you would like to join me, either just to, to kind of come along uh, for moral support or participate in the program in one way or another, I would be glad to have you do that. Just let me know and we'll figure out a Sunday that would work. Um, you, the insert gives a little bit more information about a couple of our announcements. Um, I think for announcement and business type things, that's all that I have written down. I know that Jonathan was going to say a word about Lifeline offerings. Yes, so for March, the Sundays that we have in March are for the Lifeline Food Pantry, and I put a uh, bowl out back with the sign so you can feel free to give free will donations for that. Um, also, if you're able to stay for fellowship time, we have treats and celebration of my birthday, which the actual day was yesterday. So, so we're, we're off one day on our yeah. birthdays this month. Yours was yesterday. Yeah. Last Sunday, Bill's was Monday. Mm -hmm. So sooner we'll, we'll hit one right on It'll, sooner or later. Yeah. And then maybe if people show up at the end because they didn't set their clocks forward. Uh, that's can, it. That's it. Uh, or they're just coming for refreshments. Yeah. That, either way, they'll, they're they'll, just here for the food. They'll be set. Uh, there, there have been many meetings I've gone to where I was there just for the food. So, <laughs> are there others? Other announcements? Other business type stuff? I'm happy to see uh, willing volunteers signing up for our uh, voluntary spring cleaning. Uh, cleaning is well underway. Uh, if you don't want to be responsible for an entire area, uh, check the list uh, on the bulletin board and you can consider being a helper. So uh, that's an option for you too. And I want to thank those who helped with snow removal this week and uh, it's always appreciated. It is. I, I, I saw a lot of different people working at a lot of different times and I appreciate that very much. Are there others? See Jacob. Speaking of snow, I was just going to thank Steve for shoveling this morning. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, then let's uh, continue our worship with the call to worship that's found in your worship folder. We come to the well of fear and doubt. We have drawn deeply of those waters. We come to the well of anger and hate. These waters flourish in all the land. Lord, bring us to the water of peace and hope. Lord, bring us to the well of salvation. Our hymn is number 94. If you need the tune, verses one, two, and three. Come ye thankful people. You're welcome to stand if you wish. Amen. 
Please be seated. Uh, we have uh, a few uh, prayer concerns listed here in the worship folder. Uh, one thing that's uh, both a prayer concern and uh, uh, an announcement type thing that I, I failed to mention during the announcements, uh, as, as you know, the Franklin Grove Church of the Brethren is closing. Today will be their uh, farewell service down there. That'll be this afternoon at 3 o'clock. I'm going to try and go down for that. I may see some of you there. I may not. That's all right. Franklin Grove has a has a, a long and, and powerful ministry, touched a lot of lives from a lot of people over the years. And we're glad for them and for their ministry. Uh, it's, uh, we're praying for people there as they move on to whatever is next in their spiritual lives. Uh, we're in prayer for Brethren Disaster Services, Brethren Disaster Ministries. Uh, I, I posted some pictures up here. These are four gentlemen from Correct Plumbing, K-O-R-R-E-C-T. Correct Plumbing is in uh, Dayton, Ohio, uh, and uh, they are working at a project in Dawson, uh, let me make sure I got it right, Dawson Springs, Kentucky, uh, where there were tornadoes in 2021. Those of you who've been through natural disasters, I know you've had tornadoes and things here. You know, there's whatever the immediate destruction is, and that's what catches people's eye, but then there's stuff that's ongoing for years and years after. Uh, and so these folks are working with Habitat for Humanity uh, to, uh, they're installing the plumbing, obviously, as plumbers, uh, working to uh, do some rebuilding of homes in Dawson Springs. Uh, just a little bit of background, Dawson Springs is about the same size as Polo. Uh, it's uh, uh, right around 2,400 people. The median income, medium household income in Dawson Springs is 22,000 a year. Uh, to compare that with Polo, the median income in Polo is 39,000. So 22 versus 39. The, uh, here in Polo, 9% uh, of people are below the federal poverty line, 10% uh, of people over 65. For comparison, in Dawson Springs, 27% of people are below the poverty line. 20% of them, or 20% of people 65 and over. Uh, so it's a community that was struggling with poverty. Those numbers are from before the uh, hurricane uh, and, uh, or tornado. Uh, and so they struggle, I'm sure, with it even more. The, you, the, the previous picture to this was the house that they're actually working on with Habitat. Oh, there it is. Uh, and you can see the correct plumbing. I got used to seeing those because correct plumbing was owned by a gentleman from the Bear Creek Church of the Brethren, which was the nearest Church of the Brethren when I was a pastor at Lower Miami in Dayton. And then the next picture is across the street uh, from this house uh, where you can see whatever the house or whatever it was that was there is still gone. Uh, over 75% of Dawson Springs was destroyed. Uh, nine people were killed in the tornadoes. So we're in prayer for Brethren Disaster Ministries, both in Dawson Springs uh, and the other places uh, that they're responding around the world. Lauren Haybegger is the uh, coordinator for that ministry. Uh, and so we are in prayer for them and for the people that they serve. Uh, where snow is a, an issue. Uh, it wasn't as big an issue here as it has been in some other places, but there are places over the past month in California, Portland, where they've had a significant amount of snow and are not necessarily prepared to deal with it. Uh, so we pray for those people. Uh, we continue in prayer for Helen Wales. Uh, Helen is, uh, has a doctor's appointment tomorrow and then we'll be uh, making a trip to Heritage Square to check things out. She's thinking about what the best thing is for her moving forward. So we ask for wisdom uh, and for guidance for Helen as she makes some of those decisions. We're thankful for people here in the congregation uh, and people in the community who offered love and support to her. Uh, I, many of you, I think, got the call on the prayer chain, and I don't know if Karen has more to add. Uh, we've been in prayer for Jill Adolph. Uh, she uh, died on Friday. Uh, and uh, so we are, you, you don't, you never like to say uh, that you are thankful for someone's passing because, because we're not. It's a significant loss to people who knew Jill. It's a significant loss to her family, to her friends, to her community. Uh, at the same time, people sometimes are in pain. People are sometimes in, even in agony. And our own sense of loss not just for Jill, but for any death that we go through, it's our loss, it's our grief. Uh, the person who has died, um, 
they have entered into a new life, into a different form of life, into a, a life that is free of the pain and the struggles and the loss that they went through here. And that's a hard thing to have, have perspective on. Uh, I think of it when I think of, of Jill or people like her who have been through uh, long and difficult illnesses. Um, but it's true not just for her, it's true for all of us. It's true for all of our friends, all of our family, all of the different people we read about in the newspaper. Uh, so we are in prayer for Jill, uh, for Jill's family, for Jill's friends, for those of you who were uh, an important and significant part of her life over the years. Uh, what else do we have to share with each other? We've already touched a little bit on a couple of birthdays and celebrations. We're always glad for those. While we recognize those the first of the month, we're glad to have opportunities to continue to celebrate throughout the month. Yes, Karen. An update on the services for Jill. Yes. Next Sunday from 1 to 5, there will be a celebration of life. It will be held in... Uh, the McCormick Center in Rock Falls, Illinois. If any of you know where the new Holiday Inn was built, it is, that is the area of where this building is, that is part of it. So come, the family will appreciate that. Jill's legacy in her nursing career is enormous. She had the effect, she was a very amazing supervisor and touched many, many lives and encouraged many young people who were employed in our clinic and in the hospital and other areas that she worked with to continue their medical profession. Thank you. So the celebration of life one to five next Sunday at the McCormick Center in Rock Falls. And thank you, Karen, for your support for her and for keeping us updated on what's going on with her. We appreciate that. Are there others? I'm not seeing anybody. Then let's continue our uh, worship with, uh, with our uh, preparation for prayer. O oh God, our help in ages past. Let's pray. God, you have been our help in ages past. Uh, within, our, with our, within our limited perspective and our limited lifespan, we may not be able to think of it as ages. We may think of it as days or months or years past, at the most decades past. But within the scope of history, within the scope of human existence, you have been our help in ages past, things that you did, things that happened thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, continue to make a difference in our lives today, continue to matter to us today, continue to inspire us, direct us, lead us, guide us, strengthen us, forgive us, and heal us. We thank you for the way you have been present in our lives, the lives of people we love, the lives of people we have never known who, who lived and died many, many, many years before us, the way that you will be present in the lives of people that we will never know for their lives are yet to come. 
We've lifted up some ways in which we are thankful for your presence, in which we pray for your presence. We pray for the Ministry of Brethren Disaster Services, Lauren Haybegger, as he works with that ministry and the various volunteers. We're thankful for folks like those from Correct Plumbing and, and others uh, around the nation who offer their time, offer their talent, offer their support to those suffering from natural disasters, those suffering sometimes from man-made disasters, as children's disaster response responds to shootings and things like that. We're thankful for people who offer help and hope in those big things. We're thankful for people who offer help in small things, the small things within our lives. They may not seem small to us at the moment. Certainly they may be within the huge scope of history, but we're thankful for God for people who offer help and love and support to us. To the ministry of this congregation, uh, whether through the beauty of flowers or the shoveling and scraping of snow or the, the cleaning and organizing of various rooms. We're glad for that, God. Thank you for those people. Thank you for the things they do. Help us to find ways to do the things you want us to do, God. We pray for the ministry of the Franklin Grove congregation that has touched so many lives over the years. We pray for them today as they say a formal Farewell to their building, to their organized ministry as a congregation. We know that that ministry continues through the lives that they have touched and through the people who are there who will be finding new places to serve, new places to worship, new places to minister in your name. Uh, we pray, God, for, for the people of Dawson Springs, Kentucky. We pray for the people who are going through loss, going through struggle, going through hurt, going through fear, natural disasters, wars, political instability, religious instability, sickness, whatever it may be, God. We lift those people up to you. We pray that they will know the ways in which you help, the ways in which you are there for them and the way that we will know the ways in which we can be there for them. We pray for Helen. She makes decisions about what is best for her. Help her to know what it is that she can and cannot do, where it is that she does and does not need help. What is the best way to meet her needs moving forward? That's a struggle for all of us, God, but it's a struggle as we get older it's a struggle to, and a challenge to, to give up independence sometimes. A challenge to, to say goodbye to places that we have known and loved. It's hard for us, and it's hard for anyone going through that to know what the right thing is. Helen's going through those decisions now. Help her to know what is best. Help everyone facing those kinds of decisions for whatever reason, whether it's aging or ill health or a job change or a change in life circumstance. Help, help everyone going through those decisions, God, to know your presence. We're thankful for the ministry of Jill Adolph, for her life lived among us and among so many other people. Nurses touch so many people with their lives, their ministries and often do not receive the recognition that they should. We're glad for the people in whose life Jill made a difference. We're thankful for the ways in which her life and her ministry will continue to live. We're thankful not just for Jill, but for the, the lives and ministries of nurses, doctors, all those involved in, in any of the helping professions, sometimes when we think of helping professions, we uh, limit that to nurses, doctors, social workers, and, and those certainly are people who help, but we all help in one way or another. We all have a job or a trade or a task or a skill that offers help, that offers love, that offers life. Thank you for the gifts that you give all of us. Help us to use them the way you want us to. We know that you will be 
the help of people in years to come to us and through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There are many ways in which we help, many ways in which the ministry of the congregation uh, touches people here in the congregation, we just with those of you within this room uh, and within the community and around the world. Some of that is made real uh, through the gifts that we are about to share, our tithes and our offerings, representative of the skills and the talents and the gifts that God has given us. The ushers will wait upon you now. Uh, and we will join in number 142, Brothers and Sisters of Mine. Let's pray. God, help us to recognize that these gifts matter to people around the world. I'm always struck by that image, brothers and sisters whose hearts are keeping time with our own. That's true, God. Help us to recognize them as our brothers and sisters. Help us to recognize the needs near and far that exist in the world and the ways in which you call us to meet them. Thank you for these gifts and for the people who have given them. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our uh, scripture reading this morning is a familiar one, but uh, uh, fairly long. The story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. He here is referring to Jesus. Uh, and so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had uh, gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, well, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us this well and, and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, well, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Well, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. 
Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? And then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and they made their way toward him. And meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? Well, I tell you, open your eyes. Look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Well, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Because of the woman's testimony, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Wow. Did you realize that it's harvest time? Neither did I. I mean, our first song, uh, Come Ye Thankful People Come, is one that we have sung, including today, we have sung it three times since I came here. The first was November 21st, 2021. The second was November 20th, 2022. The Sundays before Thanksgiving, which is kind of a harvest themed time, but here we are singing about harvest in March. It's nowhere near Thanksgiving. It's St. Patrick's Day Friday, but uh, we don't usually think about St. Patrick in terms of uh, harvest type stuff. I know there was stuff outside that needed to be gathered up, but that was snow, not, not crops, right? And actually, I don't know how much it needed to be gathered up as much as just moved out of the way. You know, if, if, the, if the streets and the driveways and the sidewalks are clear, I don't, I don't really care very much if there's snow someplace else most of the time. And I, you can't really do what we call with snow harvesting. We don't, you know, put it in a, a, a truck or a, a bin or something and bring it in the house. So that, that's, that's why we have running water. So we don't need to do that. That's why we have refrigerators. So why did we sing a harvest song today? Why is Jesus talking about harvesting? It's something the disciples said. When the Samaritan woman at the well has gone to tell her community about Jesus, the disciples return from grocery shopping. They encourage him to eat. Jesus tells them that he has food they don't know about. And the disciples say, wow, how'd that happen? Did someone bring him food? You remember Nicodemus last week? 
Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus that he had to be born again. And Nicodemus said, what? How can, how can anyone be born again? Can I go into my, my mother's womb again and come out again? Nicodemus could only think of it in a, in a literal sense, in a literal physical sense, while Jesus meant it in a, in a spiritual sense. That's the same thing. The same thing that's happening in this scripture reading a couple times. Jesus mentions living water. The Samaritan woman assumes he's talking about, you know, water. I wish I had water that I would not thirst anymore up here, at least on Sunday mornings. But the woman assumes he means, you know, water, liquid refreshment that you get from a, from a well or from the tap. When Jesus says he has food, the disciples assume that he means you know, food, literal, physical things to eat. Jesus says, no, no, what nourishes me is doing God's will. So the harvest Jesus is talking about isn't about bringing in the sheaves or gathering the flocks or whatever. It's about reaching people with the truth of God's love and bringing them into the kingdom of God. So yes, today is a good day to celebrate harvest time. And I don't know if I said it earlier, but Merry Christmas. It looks and, and feels a little bit like Christmas at least a little more like Christmas than harvest outside, doesn't it? This is the uh, national Christmas tree from, uh, from a few years ago. Julia and I every year like to go down and drive by that a couple times when we live near DC. It's really, it's really pretty and then each little, the little trees around it, there's one tree for each state that is decorated with uh, a theme of some sort relating to that state. I haven't seen any Christmas trees around here lately, uh, although there are to be honest, a couple of houses that still have Christmas lights up. I haven't, there were no carolers last night. Julia didn't have any, any gifts wrapped up for me this morning. Uh, so maybe I am missing something, but it looks to me as if it might be Christmas in our scripture reading. Because Christmas is of course about the birth of Christ. If you wanna put it a different way, Christmas is about God becoming human. God had interacted with humans ever since the creation. Sometimes God did that directly, like he did with Eve and with Adam and with Moses. Sometimes God did that uh, through, uh, indirectly through prophets and through kings. Uh, God even interacted with someone through a, through a donkey once. At Christmas, though, we celebrate God coming to the earth physically. We, we celebrate God becoming human in the form of Jesus. That's part of what's going on in this interaction from John. The Samaritan woman knows all about God. Samaritans and Jews worshiped the same God. When the nation of Israel split in two, the first king of Israel was Saul, the second was David, the third was Solomon, the fourth was Solomon's son Rehoboam, and during Rehoboam's time, the kingdom split into two. The northern kingdom kept the name of Israel. Their king was Omri, O-M-R-I. And he established a new city as the capital city called Samaria. That was in the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom, Rehoboam, was still the king down there. Uh, and it was called Judah. And the capital was in Jerusalem where the, the temple and, and all those things were. That's why it, it, it's important when the, the woman says, you Jews say we need to worship at, at the temple, but we worship up here on the mountain in, in Samaria. There, there was enmity between the two countries. They were at war with one another from time to time, uh, and, but they were all descended from the same family and they all worshiped the same God. They did it in slightly different ways and in different places. It's a long story that plays out over thousands of years, but the gospel here gives us the bottom line. Jews believed the only true worship was in Jerusalem. Samaritans were worshiped on a mountain near Samaria. Jews didn't have much use to Samaritan, for Samaritans, as the scripture says, usually would not interact with them. The Samaritan woman at the well knew about God. She knew about the Messiah. Today though, 
She meets God in the flesh. She, she talks to God, not in that spiritual, you know, walks with me and he talks with me, not in that, not in that spiritual kind of sense, but in a literal, physical sense. The physical God enters the Samaritan woman's world and becomes a real human person rather than an abstract person spiritual conception of some sort. So, Merry Christmas and Happy Fourth of July. Anyone doing a cookout later today? Corn on the cob, chicken, burgers, hot dogs on the grill? I'm not a big watermelon fan. Julia likes watermelon a whole lot more than I do. I bought some for her just yesterday. Maybe she'll have some a little bit later, but it's not really Picnic weather, any more than it's harvest weather, unfortunately. Are there fireworks tonight? I didn't check the, the paper. The reason I mentioned the 4th of July, technically I guess it's Independence Day, is that this Samaritan woman, she's trying to keep secrets. That's hard to do sometimes. I remember maybe 20 years ago, we still, we still lived in Virginia. Some friends came to visit us for Julia's birthday. And they came in with a cake and a, and a, wrapped, a, a wrapped gift. That was ob the gift was obviously a book, uh, especially when they handed it to us. You, know, you, you could tell it was a, a, a big book. And as soon as they walked in the door and handed us the gift, their youngest daughter, Beryl, Beryl was probably about five or so, she said, guess what your gift is? It's a book about cats. That was so sweet. Beryl and Julia both have April 1st as their birthday, so it was a combined birthday party for the two of them. And Beryl was so, so happy to come and celebrate and give Julia a gift, uh, give her a book about cats, because we had cats and she knew Julia loves cats. Uh, she, she was old enough to understand that you don't tell people what the gift is. She knew that you were supposed to let them unwrap the gift, let them find out what it is for themselves. But she was so excited she couldn't keep it a secret. When you're excited like that, it's hard to keep a secret, whether it's a, an engagement or a, a pregnancy or a new job or even a, a book about cats. Secrets can be hard. They can be hard when they're, when they're happy, you know, because it's hard to keep good things a secret. They can be especially hard when they're not the happy kind. We all have, we all have moments in our lives that we're ashamed of. We all have times when we look back that we regret, when we were cruel or hurtful that we wish we could take back. All of us have secrets of some kind, some kind of of, you know, maybe a happy, positive secret. Certainly all of us have some kind of guilt, some kind of thing we feel bad about. We may not think of them. We not, may not remember them every moment of every day, but from time to time something will happen or someone will say something or we'll read something and that it brings those feelings of guilt those feelings of shame back. Julia had a counselor who referred to those as shame pops. And the shame is back with you. And that's kind of a, a good way to think of it, even when it's something that maybe you think you've left behind. In verse 16, Jesus asks the Samaritan woman to go get her husband and come back to the well. And the woman says correctly that she has no husband. Jesus tells her she's been married five times before and is now living with a man she isn't married to. The woman certainly didn't realize that Jesus knew this and probably, I don't know, but probably didn't want him to know it. Now you might assume there's something shameful about the being married five times part. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Marriages back then were arranged by brokers acting on behalf of the family. So the families would hire a, a, essentially a matchmaker and, and the family would make the decision about whether they were gonna make the match or not. And it involved, it was a contract, a literal written binding 
contract. For us, at least in the in the legal sense, marriage is a contract, and you 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 know you get married and you register it with the the county clerk's office. And if 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 you know, God forbid, there's a divorce later on, you'll go through you'll go to the, a court and you'll get a legal divorce and you'll split the the assets this way or that way. It's a legal contract thing, but when you come to the service, you know, I've done a lot of weddings. I've never written out a contract that anyone had to sign. There's no contract like that on the license. There was for them. It was a written, legally binding contract, just like buying a house or something else. And that, what that means is that women could not sue for divorce because women were not able to make contracts then. Sometimes a woman could find a male relative to sue for divorce on her behalf, but usually not. Men had all the power when it came to divorce, to divorce. And it's not clear if the man necessarily needed a good reason to divorce the woman or not. So the five times married may or may not be shameful. Probably what was more shameful to her in that society was living with a man who was not her husband. Now, whatever happened or didn't happen with the divorces, that's the secret that the Samaritan woman was keeping. That's the, the guilt, it appears, in, in this particular scripture that she was carrying. Jesus' words freed her from that guilt. People in town already knew that. Jesus didn't know that. But once Jesus shows that he does know that, she is freed from that guilt. She is freed from that hidden secret. She can be herself in front of him. She is free to be who she is. So for the Samaritan woman, it's a happy Independence Day. And I almost forgot. Happy Good Friday, too. Or maybe a little early, if you want to get all formal about it. Good Friday this year is April the 7th. And I do admit, it's kind of weird to wish someone a happy Good Friday. We, we don't actually say that on Good Friday, since Good Friday is the day that Jesus died. That's not a happy occasion. Uh, at least not at first glance. Certainly now, looking back, we recognize the, the crucifixion and the, and the death. Uh, they have to happen in order for there to be a resurrection. So we, we get that its role in the process, but we still feel sadness at the agony and the pain and the death of Jesus. But look at the very last verse of today's scripture reading. Here's John 4. 42 again, but the townspeople said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. We have now heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. When I read those words, I thought of another place in the Bible that's where someone says something very similar. It's in Mark 15, 37 through 39. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Surely this man was the son of God. This man really is the savior of the world. Both of those responses to hearing Jesus' words, seeing the acts of Jesus' life, the son of God is, in fact, the savior of the world. The Samaritan woman, the other folks in town, recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, with like the centurion, they recognize Jesus was the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So happy Good Friday. Although it's not Good Friday. It's not Independence Day, it's not Christmas, it's not harvest season, not here. It is harvest season for many crops right now in the Southern Hemisphere. It's not those days formally, technically on our calendars. It could be though, 
could be in our lives. Every day can be Christmas or harvest or whatever. Here are some questions suggested by Jesus and the woman at the well. Do we recognize that every day is a day where with our lives, we can invite someone else into the joy of the kingdom of God? Each day, can we find a way to let God use us to make God's presence known in a real, tangible way? Are we able, day to day, to claim and live out of the freedom that comes with being forgiven of our sins and forgiving other people that same way? Will we declare the truth of Jesus' claims with our words and our actions and recognize him not just as Savior, but as Lord? When we fall short of those kinds of goals, and we all do sometimes, we make it that much harder for the light of Christ to shine through us. The world is just a little bit darker. When we live the way that Jesus calls us to, every day can be Christmas or Independence Day or Good Friday. Every day can be a day to harvest. Every day can be a day to share the living water of Christ. Amen. Our closing song is number 540, Strong, Righteous Man of Galilee. You're welcome to stand if you wish. Go now with God and go in peace. Amen.